occupational diseases. Johannes previous, previously worked as an occupational hygienist and senior consultant for Resource Environment Associations uh, Associates Limited in Toronto. He holds a PhD in chemistry from the University of Munster in Germany and has an extensive background in scientific research and health and safety. Dr. Dolmer joins us today to speak on the topic of respirable, respir <laughs> see I practice that one too, respirable, res you know what he's going to speak about, it's in the Thank you very much, Professor well, Speckhardt. Can you start off by teaching us how to say that? Respirable. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> All right, good afternoon everybody, and I uh, thank you for the nice um, respirable silica, and that's what uh, I kind of want to talk about uh, today a little bit. Um, our, um, we'll talk a bit about why this is important, and then the, the really the, the good parts, we say, I think, at least from of the presentation, is uh, we'll introduce a tool that we can use to really enhance the situation in Brunswick workplaces um, and start with construction sites. Um, as, can, as this picture already kind of illustrates, yes, uh, respirable silica <coughs> is a particular concern in construction and in construction work, and we'll go over a little bit about why that is um, as well. So I thought about a bit about well how to structure this, and and it, you provided a very nice way into this um, because it is. Uh, I figured we'll explain what respirable silica actually is. Right? What, what does this term refer to? And the first thing we have to talk about then is respirable. What does that mean? Why are we concerned about that? Essentially, it has to do with our respiratory system, um, our, our airways, our lungs, um, and uh, that, needless to say, a respiratory hazard would attack the respiratory system. So we'll start off by looking a little bit at um, our lungs. Um, we have our respiratory system, upper respiratory system, we're not too concerned about that when it comes to silica. Um, we can tell you also why in a second. Um, and then the, as we inhale, essentially, we inhale, the air goes through our mouth, makes an area down uh, into our lungs, and there it actually nicely, you can see that nice here, it branches off into smaller and smaller and smaller little branches, and then eventually, uh, into this uh, little plastic looking, uh, <coughs> almost grape looking um, organs called alve alveoli. And this is where, so to say, the breathing in action really happens, right? This is the gas exchange region where our blood picks up the oxygen that we inhaled and disposes of the carbon dioxide <coughs> and we exhale that again, right? This is really the primary functionality of our lungs. Um, it is to say, this is very, very small, right? We're dealing with molecular exchanges here now. So this is a very, very small space, small area. Um, why are we talking about this? Because the size here really matters. When we talk about respirable particulates <coughs> or dust, respirable dust or anything airborne that's res uh, respirable, it really refers to the ability of these particulates to travel down all the way of our respiratory system all the way down into uh, the alveoli. So as you can imagine, we do have, when we look at a certain dust, um, we, do, we can have different particulate sizes, so different sizes of the number of particulates that we have in the air. Needless to say, the smaller the particulate is, the farther it will travel down into your lungs. And of course, also needless to say, the farther it can travel down, the more damage it will, uh, it will do. Okay? So when we talk about respirable particulates, it really means that fraction, typically we say about below 4 microns in, in the uh, diameter, um, <coughs> that can reach all the way down to the other body and uh, can do significant damage there. We'll see that in a minute, actually. Um, similar to a to, uh, presenter talk that uh, I borrowed a safety video also from Marcel uh, PC, um, which is nicely expressed this point. So that's, that's the first part of the part. Silica, second part of the term. Silica, highly common mineral, uh, natural occurring material, of course. Maybe if you 
consider the earth crust uh, maybe the most one of the most common materials that we have. Um, Tarn of sand, uh, of course, as we know. Um, but what we're concerned about is really the crystalline silica. Somebody, sometimes for quartz or alpha quartz, um, but for, for practical <coughs> or from a practical perspective, it's all the same for us, right? This is really the, the, uh, the most common forms of crystalline silica and crystalline silica is what we're concerned about. So where we can find that in granite and concrete at varying uh, various uh, percentages, 25 to 75 percent, um, but very common, of course, sand, depending on the makeup, up to 100 percent. Um, of course, in, in brick, it's an asphalt, and now it's a recent development, let's say, we also have engineered or artificial stones or countertops that uh, are actually made up of up to 90% of crystalline silica. So working, working with those uh, uh, quite well. Now let's combine those terms, uh, those terms with respirable silica. It really means making it airborne. And this is also where the plastic and construction industry come in primarily, right? In order for silica to be a hazard to us, it has to be airborne. Okay. Similar to asbestos in a sense. Asbestos is also not dangerous for us, it's just sitting there or packed concrete or whatever it is, it is, it, uh, it is dangerous to us as soon as it becomes airborne. Same with silica. If we have a task that makes it airborne, then we can inhale it, we can uh, get travel to our lungs, we can do damage. So all of those tasks then uh, create a concrete silica dust, <coughs> dust often, um, and therefore crystalline silica can become airborne. So we see cutting here, grinding, or not form of cutting, sand blasting, grinding, etc. Um, another note here, I also have this, this kind of picture, kind of hard to see, but this is kind of like a dust cloud, and in my mind, uh, it nicely illustrates uh, that yes, if you have a dust, there are different size fractions within that dust. We're not too concerned about the, the heavy dust that we can see, right? That we can see our upper respiratory tract filters that out. Well, it looks a bit really, uh, gross, maybe later grow all the nose, but I'm not concerned about that whatsoever because that is, that is actually what our respiratory tract is made uh, for to filter those things out. What I'm concerned about is what we actually cannot see in this picture. The size fraction that's, that's respirable is invisible. The particles are too small, okay? but those, those are the ones that, make, uh, that, that really create the damage. So what does that mean? Damage. And that's, then we talk about the health effects of silica exposure. And uh, those are severe. The two big ones really are silicosis and lung cancer <coughs> are both potentially fatal uh, diseases. Um, silicosis is essentially caused by scarring of the lungs. Uh, again, we'll see the video in a minute, but, but if you want to break it down, cut it down, you can say, okay, the, the silica particle enters your lungs and this uh, uh, alveoli leads to scarring in that area. Uh, that area that is scarred now is not available for air exchange anymore, which means for the time <coughs> it becomes harder. And if that, if that happens long enough, and uh, in other words, if it has a sufficient number of uh, silica particulates, then the breathing, breathing becomes so hard um, that the victim actually dies of heart failure. Um, so that's essentially silicosis. Uh, there is no known cure. Um, so once you have it, it that's, that's uh, difficult, right? Our body doesn't have a way to, uh, to uh, regrow, so to say, um, the lung tissue that, that will be required. Um, and depending on severity, it can be fed twice a the disease. Um, we differentiate a bit between chronic accelerated and acute uh, silicosis. This is based on the extent of the exposure to silica. We don't have to go into too much detail. <coughs> um, and lung cancer uh, also. We know that there's a, high, uh, uh, a higher chance of developing lung cancer if you're exposed to silica, uh, silica, spider silica. Um, and as we know, lung cancer also diseases. So those are really the two big ones that
is one of the most common substances on Earth. It can be found in materials like sand and rock, and building products like copper and brick. When the worker cuts, grinds, or drills materials that contain silver, dangerous crystalline silicon dust is released into the air. <coughs> As the worker breathes, silica crystals flow into his mouth and nose and down the air passages deep into the lungs. <coughs> enter the small, fragile air sacs where oxygen is absorbed into the blood. Immune system cells, called macrophages, engulf and try to dissolve the crystals, but they are unable to. Over time, more and more crystals build up inside the macrophage cells. The macrophages carry the silica into the walls of the lung, where they die. Scar tissue forms around the dead cells and spreads as more cells die. This damage can continue even after the exposure to silica stops. <coughs> Eventually, so much scar tissue forms that the lungs can no longer function. For information on how to protect yourself from silica exposure, visit worksafebc.com.
typical sampling setup, you have a pump, you draw air through the pre-filter, and you kind of make sure that all these are respirable part of the dust will collect on this filter media. Here's the filter media. Um, so you, you have to work with that for four to eight hours. Um, you can see this guy here, yeah, I can kind of see it, I guess, but he's where the pump and the filter. Sampling there, and uh, you have to do his work right with the with the best gas you currently have at, at that time in terms of his own collection. You have to do that work, and then you collect that filter, send it to a lab, and two to three weeks from now you can actually tell them, hey, you work or you were not protected as you were doing that task, <laughs> which is uh, of course all exaggerated a bit because you use that information then for future planning of your work tasks, etc. But but what happens if, if Tasks change, right? You now we have a different tool, you have a different, uh, different substrate that you cut. Now you're, you're grinding instead of cutting, right? So you have to redo it all, you have to wait another three weeks until you have information. Um, so it is, it is uh, time consuming, it is costly to do it that way, and it's not overly protected for the employees of, especially in the construction environment where we have. So many different tasks, and change, uh, the task parameters change so often and so quickly. And this is really where the Silica tool comes in that I want to talk about now, because <coughs> sorry, back here one sec. Uh, it it cuts really it, it cuts all the evaluation piece. You can go straight from identification <coughs> to control, and I'm going to talk about that and uh, show you how that works. But essentially, the Silica tool. So this is an online risk assessment tool that is created by uh, BCCSA, or hosted, I should say, by BCCSA at the moment. Um, it, is, it is a really unique uh, tool in, uh, for Silica and really useful. It takes um, more than 5,000 person Silica measurements, so data sets, essentially, and applies uh, it to a model that we can use, that the tool user can use, in order to predict what exposure their workers would face when doing a certain task. That's kind of the idea. It creates task-specific exposure assessments. <coughs> so you take, take a look at the task that you're doing, you put that into the tool, and the tool will tell you this is your likely exposure to the worker. And then you can say, okay, we, it, as it says, this is controlled and uncontrolled, so that then I can put controls into place, and say a wet piece or whatever it is, um, and you get another number, another estimate of the exposure of the work. And then you can base your final uh, personal protective equipment decision on this. So that's, uh, we'll, we'll walk through that in a minute. Um, just a little bit more background on this. So the, the idea here is that it, it provides a very easy access to all this data from the 5,000 uh, uh, measurements that we have and apply it to to essentially a lay person uh, when it comes to occupational hygiene, which is really great because you don't need people like me to design a sampling strategy and to interpret the results and to forecast what's going to happen in the workplace. You can do all this online and put, put your task in and essentially uh, get, get really a meaningful plan, meaningful result in terms of what this means uh, for, for your controls. Um, you can use that to educate employers and workers. Show the labor, you can actually uh, select and deselect uh, control options and see what the expo what does that do to our exposure, what does that do to, uh, to the effects of the workers. Uh, so it is also an education tool for sure. It produces in the end an exposure <coughs> control plan. And this exposure control plan can uh, be used as the name suggests to control the exposure to tools, so to protect the workers in, in the field. Also, the plan itself is a training tool. Right. Um, you can you can uh, you can educate the workers and the supervisors to simply follow the steps on the exposure control plan and have a better protection of your employees uh, in the field. Uh, so the idea is that uh, every associ uh, association member will have access uh, to this. So we we as WorkSafe working with uh, BCSA to make that happen. Um, details on that I would say to follow. There will also be, uh, as I understand it, the, the training session on the on the tool use itself. Um, but again, this is something that every association member will have access to this and can use it. From our perspective, so from work, from the work safe perspective, we can then use the uh, resulting exposure control plans to verify 
compliance in the field as well, right? So we don't have to go out and measure and, and prove that workers are under or overexposed. Um, we, we will, and we make a commitment, we simply will take the exposure control plan, see are the inputs the same that we see actually as work in the field, are the controls the same that uh, are indicated and are, that are adhered to, that are indicated in the exposure control plan. If both of those match up, uh, we will say, okay, you are compliant. And in the end, the most beneficial of all of this is it will provide better worker protection. There's no question. That's why, why we are interested in this, for sure. So I'll walk you quickly through the tool. After you, after you, maybe you can't see that well, can you? Uh, can we read the, the fine print here? But I'll, I'll walk you a little bit through it and I'll describe what's happening here. As I mentioned, this is an online tool. Um, so once you have access to the, to the tool, you can log in, you can create an employer profile, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, then create a job site uh, profile, and you, you provide some details. Um, then it really goes into the identification of the task. That is kind of your work activity. And the work activity is really the input. So here you can describe what is what is the task that is being performed, which material are we working with, and which tools are we working with. So, as an example, you can kind of see that here, I guess, again, I apologize. Um, but, but these are drop-down menus. So you select, let's say we work with concrete, we're doing concrete cutting, <coughs> and we use a power, uh, power saw. So that defines your work activity. You further can define that then by, um, by going into the work area integration. So you define, okay, this is outside or inside, it's a confined space, which changes the exposure profile, possibly. Whatever it is, let's say it's outside, and we're doing it for four to eight hours. So also your exposure uh, duration is being set. Um, and then the tool will give you the first exposure analysis. So the first estimate of what the workers' exposure would look like if there are no controls in place. So for this job, again, this was outside cutting of concrete with a power saw. Very benign, or not benign, but a fairly common, uh, common task that is being done, four to eight hours. And it indicates to you, well, it says it's a real, and the red color it speaks to that as well. Yes, you're well over the exposure limit. Right? Remember, exposure limit 0.025, we had 0.829, which is precisely, it also will give you that information, 3,396% over the exposure limit. That's good information to have because it tells you how we well fail, right? So we have to put protection in place. As the next step, then, it will go into controls. It will first ask you is elimination and substitution possible? which sounds kind of silly, right? And it is actually in the, in the tool. So if you click here, then, yeah, we can eliminate this task, the tool will tell you, please stop. Like, stop using the tool, stop wasting our time. You can eliminate it, get it out of your work. But why is it doing this? Because it's based on, and we should hopefully all know this, the hierarchy of controls. <coughs> Elimination, substitution first, then engineer controls, then administrative controls, and last, and these, first the collective equipment in terms of protection of our work. So we will just prompt you this, this uh, is it possible to eliminate this task? We really have to do um, question first, but then it will go into actually useful questions um, in terms of engineering controls. And depending on the task and the tool that is being selected, we have a choice of possible engineering controls that are listed here. Um, so for, for instance, here we have, uh, for this cutting, we could select uh, Local exhaust ventilation on the tool. You could select uh, wetting uh, integrated into the tool or external wetting of the substrate that you're cutting, um, which was selected here. So um, you have a bunch of different control options that you can choose from an engineer's perspective, uh, from an engineer control perspective. And then it goes into administrative controls. Um, the tool logic, I don't think, considers really uh, the administrative controls as affecting the 
exposure itself as much, but it goes over a list of administrative controls that should that are good idea to put in place, and it really the answers your answers here will be built into your pressure <coughs> control plan. So often this is just a problem. Do right? we think about this if we do this diminishing train or workers, right? Um, that's kind of the idea that it will be integrated into your exposure control plan. But yes, inspection, maintenance of tools, housekeeping, decontamination. Uh, silica safety instruction training, uh, emergency preparedness, workshop scheduling, barriers and closures. Um, so to protect others that are not doing the same task. So once, once you go through that, then it will give you another exposure analysis. This time with the primary engineer control that was expected. Right? You can already see it cut it roughly in half. We are now at 0 0.441 as opposed to 0 0.8, 0 0.9 that we were before. Um, and also, and this is where we're kind of playing around with the tools now tonight because you can see how effective your controls are. It does give you how um, the percentage on how much dust we actually reduce by putting the control in. So in this case, 47%. Needless to say, we're still over our exposure limit, right? So we're still quite significantly over. But this is the best we can do, or uh, not necessarily the best we can do, but given the control option we selected, this would be the result. And then the tool will go into PPE. So it will then recommend or prescribe what, what type of respiratory protection would be needed um, to complete this task with that given control. So in this case, you <coughs> can't see that, but in this case, protection factor 25 is required. And the tool will, and this is important, will give you the a minimum respiratory protection that is required. You can hold it also high, right? So here the intimidation, you do require a little bit of knowledge on respiratory protection, uh, on the code of practice for respiratory protection typically, and uh, primarily understand what this protection factor means and what kind of respir uh, respirators um, uh, can be used uh, given, in this case, uh, required protection factor 25. Which would, which would be minimum loose fitting power in the amplifying respirator for, with, a, with a 100 hertz, so yeah, or 100 hertz. Um, And I'm saying that has to be the minimum, right? It can also go higher, and, and often, in, especially in this case, this is an example where you might want to go higher, uh, just from a cost factor perspective, because the full face respirator that actually has a high protection factor um, is much less costly. The ones that are depicted here, this is about 2,500, I think, and this is about 200. So there's a, there's a significant factor also from the costing perspective there. But the main point is the protection factors, the tool will give you the minimum <coughs> protection factor. So you always have to do it higher, but the piece will know. Okay. I also should know, note, and this is a bit technical uh, detail, but um, these protection factors shown here are uh, based on the newer CSA standard. That what we currently sign in regulation. Hopefully that will change, but it will change next year, hopefully early next year. And we have an updated uh, CSA Z94.4.11, we refer to 2016 that we'll sign to. And then the protection factors that we have in, in the, or through legislation will also match the ones that are being used in the tool. In the meantime, as you use the tool, please just stick with whatever the tool gives you uh, and the, the selection criteria under the updated CSA. <coughs> the tool will then provide an exposure control plan. I described this before. So this is essentially a PDF print off um, that can be used also for training purposes. And useful also, there's a summary page that describes this is the task, this is the exposure without controls, this is the exposure with controls, and this is the resulting respiratory protection required. So very useful, very easy to utilize. Um, and this is just, if you could read this, uh, I will go over this a little bit more, but uh, this is just playing around with the tool. So this, this was respiratory protection um, without control, so you can do the same exercise, just deselect the control and you will see well, what, does, what effect does it have on my required protection factor, or respiratory protection. Um, or if we implement better control, this is an example where uh, I chose an LED integrated into the, into the tool and it cuts further down the exposure to 75%, I think that's removed. So 
there are ways that actually are quite educational, that you can run through the tool, select different control options, see what makes sense, also from a planning perspective, uh, offers you great insight in terms of, well, what does make sense from a, from a financial perspective, uh, where, where to put my money, right, and what kind of protection will that, will that result from. So we are quite excited about this because I think it, it will really help protect the worker from something that is that fatal, potential fatal disease doesn't get more, more significant than that, I guess. And um, yeah, before before closing, I want to do a couple of things. First, I want to uh, want to extend my thanks uh, to DCCSA who provided demo access to this, so I can put this together, and uh, actually to my colleague from the Hypertrain and the Ops Occupational Journalist over there. Um, we chatted quite a bit about uh, about their approach uh, for us, well, uh, for, for the city that will. And I must admit, uh, to the restricted time, was bought some of the slides, or at least some of the information. Uh, so thanks uh, to her. And the other thing, before we go into questions, I, I just want to close with one, with one thought. And that, that kind of extends a little bit from Silica over to, let's say, health hazards or occupational hygiene. And I talked about this, this uh, I guess, last week. Um, we are very much in the safety management uh, of We think about safety, we think about, and you hear that statement a lot, we want to make sure that our workers go home unharmed. We want to keep them safe. We want to send them the same way that they came to work back to, back to home, right? That they're, uh, that they're safe at home. And I, I was in a meeting where that where the gentleman made that statement and essentially said we're working very hard to make this happen. Very committed to making sure that our people go safe at uh, home. I wanted to extend this. I want you to think we don't only want to send our people safe home, we want to send them healthy home. The effects, Silica is a great example of this, because one of the things he said, if there was any concern that the worker has, he brings it to us and we act on it. We make sure he goes home safe. Silica, you don't know. Can breathe that in for 20 years without noticing a, a thing if it's really respirable silica until you get diagnosed with silicosis. So I want you to extend that, that safety thinking. Don't only send them home the same way they came. Make sure they're healthy. Make sure once they reach retirement age, they can go home and enjoy retirement without occupational disease, without is the facts that they gained from 20 years ago in the workplace. <coughs> so I'll just leave you with that, uh, and hopefully, well, there are questions and feedback that we can, uh, can certainly discuss. Um, so if you have any questions. Can you get exposed to silica and not get silicosis? Yes. Okay. Yes. Not everyone's going to get it. No, not everybody's going to get silicosis. So that, that's kind of the whole or one of the idea of occupation exposure limits, right? We assume there is a safe, or what we can consider, and scientifically speaking, our best guess, in terms of there's a safe concentration that we all can be exposed to, right? So our body is, is for, for a lot of things, our body is equipped with dealing with minimal amounts that is uh, that in, you know, of intake of even adverse substances, etc. to clear that out. Silicone or silica is one of the things, yeah, it does stick in your lungs, right? So there will be a bit of scarring in the lungs, but our lung volume is, is so big, it's so sufficient that we can deal with a little bit of that, right? So as a matter of fact, yes, we all breathe in, we all inhale at some point of our life respiratory silica. We all inhale uh, asbestos fibers, <coughs> too, because that is naturally curing as well to a certain degree, just from natural degradation of rock and stuff. Um, and our lungs are okay with that, right? There's enough, so to say, enough of lung tissue that uh, an exposure underneath the occupation exposure limit, the lungs will function long enough for you to die of right? That's kind of the end, right? There's, there's enough reality, so to say, in terms of lung tissue. Uh, I know there's no nice way to phrase that, but. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of the idea, yeah. So, um, Silica exposure tool there that you showed, we've been using that for a couple of years now. Okay. Um, 
In British Columbia, you have to have an exposure control plan when you're 50% of the permissible exposure limits. Is there any discussion at Work Safety Project about that coming into fruition here? We, um, again, the, the discussion at the moment is that the uh, exposure control plan will be one of the ways you can show us compliance. Or you can do air testing, right? That's, that's kind of the, the, the thinking at the moment. Um, the, the, the question, and I mean, we have in our legislation as well that uh, if, if there's belief that 